that I mentioned, which is attracting a lot of interest at the moment, which is um, random matrix theory. Marco, can you can you mute, please? Ah, you're not okay. So, could you please make Marco Mondelli host again, so he can keep up his good work as a chat master? Okay, that, wonderful. That do I need to make him the host? No, no, August. No, no, not you. No. Okay, so we'll start this um, session on random matrices with, with two talks, and the first one is going to be given by Webna Kenner, who's at, um, you know, who just finished a visit to, to Vienna at IST, and who's also um, based at NYU. So, Ben, thank you very much for coming in person, and take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, so, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, the organizers. Um, so, let me say first, everything I'm telling you about is joint work. Sorry, I have to start recording. Recording in progress. There we go. Um, thank you for coming. So everything I'm telling you about is joint work with Gerard Benarus and Paul Bergad, who are my PhD advisors at NYU. Um, so the title of my talk is Landscape Complexity Beyond Invariance. Uh, and actually, almost the whole story of the talk is in these four pictures right here, which also explain the title. Okay, so these are landscapes. That's my name for random functions, so graphs of random functions here from, say, so the unit square into R. They're ni nice, smooth Gaussian functions. Everything is smooth, differentiable, whatever. Um, and I'm thinking of the ones on the left as being more complex because they have more critical points, and the ones on the right as being more simple, because they don't. So that's my notion of complexity, is just how many critical points do you have? Okay. Um, beyond invariance means that, and you can see this more in the ones on the right, they have kind of different directions, right? So they're sort of a steep direction and kind of a flat direction. And this is sort of a technical novelty on what's happening. Um, and you can also see going from left to right the kind of phase transition that I want to prove things about, right? So there's, what's happening is there's sort of some signal that I'm adding, and as I'm adding a signal, the critical points kind of disappear and things become simple. So that's, that's the basic story. Um, and in notation, what's happening is, is I have some random functions fn from rn to r. So the only thing that's misleading about the picture is that it's a two-dimensional picture because that's what I can draw, but I'm interested in high-dimensional behavior. Okay, so I have functions fn from rn to r. Um, they have few distributional symmetries. And I'll give you an example of what, what I mean. It's not so clear right now, which is okay. Um, and what I want to compute is what's called the annealed complexity, which means I take the number of critical points that's my notation crit fn. Right? That's an integer valued random variable. And I want to take the expectation and understand is this exponential or not? So when I say a lot of critical points or not a lot, I just mean do you have exponentially many or sub exponentially many? So I take the one over n log scaling and I get this number sigma. Okay, so sigma is a real number. And this, is an, this is a whole talk just about computing this number. Okay? And just to rearrange, it says that on average, the number of critical points is exponential in n and the prefactor is sigma. So, so you could ask for what the value is, but today I'll just give you a simple version where you're really only interested in whether sigma is positive. That's the complex case where you have a lot of critical points. Or if it's zero, meaning you have few. Okay. Um, and let me give you sort of informally the main theorem of today. And I want to emphasize that we have some sort of general techniques, which we illustrated in a few kinds of examples, and I picked the one that I thought was best for this conference, um, which is a signal plus noise model. So I'm going to give you later on a certain function that has the form signal plus noise. Um, but the signal strength is, is not a signal to noise ratio. It's not a positive real number. It's actually described by some probability measure, saying sort of combining different signal strengths. Um, and what we're doing is we're finding the exact threshold for this model between the complex case and the simple case. And it turns out that this threshold is actually described by the inverse second moment of this probability measure. So I have a signal measure, and somehow the observable of it that matters is the inverse second moment. Um, and the proof sketch, which I'll talk about at the end, is, is this goes via sort of new results on determinants of random matrices. Okay. Um, so let me emphasize sort of why would you care about this, give you some suggestions why asking these kinds of questions might be interesting. So I just copied over what, what, what we're looking at. Um, I'm going to give you three reasons you might care and emphasize that these are really rules of thumb. They're not theorems. Okay. So the first reason, um, maybe the most relevant here, is that you might hope to predict dynamics of optimization on Fn. So fn is a random function of many variables, maybe it's like a loss function or something like this, um, and you want to find the minimum with something like gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. Okay, some, if, and, and all these local minima that are not the global ones, right, are traps. You spend sort of a lot of time in these things, um, and so you would imagine at a first pass that if sigma is not positive, meaning I have sub-exponentially many critical points, and optimization should be easier, whereas if I have a lot of critical points, optimization should be harder. Okay, so this is just a way to guess. Um, alternatively, you can use it to locate or guess sort of extremal values. So if you think, where is the global minimum of my function, you can imagine this variant sigma of t that actually scans sort of sublevel sets. And say, if I look at very low sublevel sets, I can't get too far away from the mic. So if I get, look at very low sublevel sets, 
Um, I don't see anything because there's no function down there. And, and when I sort of raise this up, when I hit the global minimum, I pick up one critical point, which is the global minimum. As I keep going higher, I get more and more. Um, so in this way, you could actually find what the local minimum is, sorry, the global minimum. Um, the last thing, which is a little bit uh, vague phrasing, but that's also because it's sort of not so clear on the physics side, and this is really a physics motivation, uh, is this should be connected to replica symmetry, replica symmetry breaking. Meaning that if Fn is, if I look at sort of the Gibbs measure with Hamiltonian Fn, um, then at low temperature, this Gibbs measure should be dominated by sort of local minima with low energy values. And you can imagine studying how these are arranged, which is basically the question of replica symmetry, um, via, well, this guy that looks at sublevel sets, but actually one that just counts minima. Uh, and for experts, I'll say you probably want the quenched version. So variants of this function um, can, can tell you sort of interesting things about the function you care about. Uh, and I emphasize that from all these points, what really matters is actually the sign of sigma, not the value. Um, and that might seem like it's easier, but it's probably harder, uh, because in our techniques and other things, it's maybe possible to get variational formulas for sigma, and then it's really not clear what the sign is. But I'm mostly gonna hide this issue because in the example today, there's some sort of miracle that lets you actually compute the sign. So, but I wanted to mention it's, it's, it's not that trivial. Um, so let me give you a classical model, and I'll give you sort of the extension in a moment. But the classical, if I wanna have a sigma plus noise model, um, the easiest noise you could start by asking for is something that should be, okay, Gaussian, um, centered probably, and then isotropic, which is a phrase from Gaussian process theory that informally means that it sort of looks the same everywhere. Um, if you want a formal version, it says that the covariance between points is some function just of the distance between points, and I put this reference because the question of what functions B can you put here I was actually answered quite a long time ago. Um, the function B, I, I'm gonna, I need it to phrase the theorems properly, but I don't need to worry about it that much, so we'll sort of put this issue aside. Um, and just the function Vn itself, it looks the same everywhere, so it has infinitely many critical points, right? This is basically a, a picture of it. It's defined on all of Rn. Um, and so the classic solution is you constrain it quadratically. So you add mu times norm of x squared, where mu is now some like, signal-to-noise ratio that you can pick. Um, and I think of this mu times norm of x squared as being a signal. Right? And I ask, what changes as I vary mu? Okay, so if mu is very small, the picture basically looks like this. Um, basically, it's a noise model, and I have a lot of critical points. Whereas if mu is really big, it's basically quadratic, but it's kind of quadratic, it's a little bit wiggly, but these wiggles aren't really critical points. Right? So the idea is that increasing mu should kind of simplify the landscape, and you can see that um, in this video, go back here. Um, so as I'm increasing mu, you can see the, the critical points that are kind of far away from the origin, they're sort of these cups, and they kind of start tipping until they're not critical points anymore. Right. Let me show this one more time. So from this, you can kind of guess the theorem, which is gonna be that there's some phase transition in mu, and when mu is large, I have very few critical points, and when mu is small, I have lots. Right. So indeed, that's the result. I'll, before I, I'll, I'll give you the sort of formal version in a moment, but it says that the complexity of the model with parameter mu um, does have a phase transition. There's a critical mu c, and if mu is at least this, uh, sorry, if mu is at most this, then the noise wins, which is a way of um, characterizing the idea that there's a lot of critical points. Whereas if mu is at least this threshold, uh, then there's very few critical points. There's sub-exponentially many. Okay. Um, uh, this b appears, right, so there's always this function b, which sort of determines the noise that I'm carrying around, but I don't want to worry about it too much. Um, everything here is explicit. I'm just not writing down the formulas to save space. But because it's explicit, you can see that this phase transition, this, this function sigma is a continuous function, and it's quadratic at criticality, right? So there's, so here's mu, here's sigma of mu, here's mu critical, um, it is zero at least here, and then this local behavior is quadratic. So it's a second order phase transition, okay? Um, this is a result of Jan Fyodorov in 2004, which is also nice because it's kind of the first theorem in this whole business, um, this sort of landscape complexity program. Um, and a few years later, along with Ian Williams, he extended to a similar result for local minima. So not counting all the critical points, but just counting local minima, which is maybe more relevant for something like gradient descent. Um, there you have the same sort of behavior. There's this amusi. It's the same one, actually, which is not obvious. And you have a cubic rate at criticality, so it's sort of different. It's a third order phase transition. Um, also, just to give you a name you'll see in the literature, this, this phenomenon is called topological trivialization. The idea being that when mu is small, I have some kind of complicated function and as I add more signal, as the signal strength kind of increases, you can see this in the change of the number of critical points. This, everything kind of simplifies. Okay, so if you see that phrase, that's what this means. Um, I'm gonna give you an extension. In a moment, I will explain why this extension is kind of natural, 
but first if you'll allow me to just do something that looks fun. Um, instead of this quadratic thing, right, which has sort of uh, the same steepness mu everywhere, I'm instead gonna consider this variant where I take half my directions, and, so it's still quadratic, but I give kind of half my direction steepness one and half my direction steepness two. Okay, so it's something you can do. Um, that's my function gn of x, that's kind of this two directions guy. And I put, an, again, a new in front for scaling. So there, there's pictures of this down here. Right? So it looks like before, except when new is really large, you can see that it really is a two directions thing. Right? Um, so from the picture, or, or otherwise, it's kind of easy to guess there should be some critical new c. And the question is, what is it? And how does it compare to the, sort of the model where everything is the same? Um, so when I started thinking about this, there were three things that I thought were kind of natural guesses. One natural guess is, well, maybe the flattest directions dominate which is basically the same as saying that gn is approximately norm of x squared. In that case, you would have that you just plug in norm of x squared here, so then nu c would be the same as mu c. Right? Or the opposite, which is that the steepest directions would dominate. That would say that g of n would be basically like twice norm of x squared. Um, and then you, because you have this two, you would need a one half, so nu c would be basically one half of mu c. Or the one which seems to me the most natural, which is that the directions would average in the easiest way, so gn would be sort of like three halves times norm of x squared, um, in which case mu c would be two thirds of mu c. So these were the guesses that I thought were natural. Um, and the fun answer is that they're all wrong. Uh, so actually mu c is, is square root five eighths times mu c. It's about 0.79. So the directions are averaging, um, but not in the easiest way, in kind of a complicated way. Okay, so here's, here's the general model um, and, and why you might consider this. So, so I'm taking uh, dn to be some n by n matrix, and I'm considering this quadratic form. Okay, so before I had dn being a diagonal matrix, which was half nu and half two nu, right? Um, I want it to be positive definite because I want everything to go up. I want it to be actually confining, right? Um, and of course, when dn is constant times identity, you recover the previous model, so this is really a generalization that sort of allows you to have different directions. Okay, so why would, you, why would you care about this? I want to suggest this is, this is a toy model for how a general Gaussian function might look near its global minimum. I'm not saying it's a good model, but I'm saying it's a toy model. Um, if, because if I have another Gaussian function, gn, then I want it to just Taylor expand to the global minimum. So say it's at zero, Taylor expand to second order, right? I have this constant. Um, the first order vanishes because it's a minimum, and so I just have the second order. So if I'm asking the question, what does it look like? You know, does it look like this, or does it look like this, or something? The constant doesn't matter. That's just a vertical shift, just changes things. Okay, so it's really this, and I'm gonna do something kind of dumb, which is write the, the, the Hessian as just the expectation plus the thing minus its expectation, right? Okay, um, and the expectation is, it, I sort of, this term is now a quadratic form where the matrix inside is positive definite because it's a global minimum, but it's not, it, it's from this perspective, it's very natural to assume that it could be something general. It doesn't have to be a constant times identity anymore. Right, so this is what this, this kind of expectation I, I model by x dn of x. Um, and then the remainder is something centered, so I'm, I'm modeling it by vn, which is a fairly strong assumption, but at the moment it's, it's something. Right? Um, and then the theorem, so I have to sort of give you what, is, what uh, large n coherence. Right? So large n coherence is that I have some sequence of deterministic n by n matrices. And the right way to think about this is that they're empirical measures, which is the average of delta masses at the eigenvalues, tend to some limit measure mu d. Okay, so mu d, let me write this here. Um, this is really my signal measure now. It says that I have, you know, so mu d is maybe something like this. I could have even different components. This is mu d. Um, it says I have, you know, some uh, steepnesses that are over in this direction, some more over here. I have some different, so it's a quadratic saying, you know, I have different steepnesses, different directions. Um, this is some compactly supported measure. Again, it should be on the right half line because I want everything to go up. I want this to really be confining. And this is the function I had before. So in the example I gave you, mu d was just an average of delta masses at nu and two nu, but you could have something more general. Um, and the result is that, okay, again, you can, and this is sort of the main theorem of the talk, um, you can see a phase transition. Again, there's this issue of b that I'm hiding from you. But you can see a phase transition, and, and the thing that you have to compare to a certain threshold is the inverse second moment of the measure. You can kind of ask sort of a natural question, which is I have this measure, what is, there should be you know, some scalar I take away from it that's sort of the effective signal to noise ratio. And what I was proposing before was my guesses were it would be either the left endpoint or the right endpoint or the mean. 
but it's actually not. It's the inverse second moment. Okay, this is the right way the arrows have to go. Um, so this phase transition is is continuous. Um, there, so there, sorry, there are formulas that are explicit-ish. I mean, explicit enough to see that it's continuous, um, and it's quadratic. But what I mean by quadratic is next time I have a measure is is uh, I fix the measure and I vary the noise, which appears as a scalar. I'll hide that. Um, we have an analogous result for local minima also, which is so again more sort of more relevant for gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, um, with the same threshold and a cubic rate. Um, so the, the fact that the inverse second moment is kind of the effective signal to noise ratio is new as far as we know, um, but you can think of this as a universality result for the quadratic and cubic exponents, sort of saying it's a second order or third order phase transition, because those already appeared in the results of Fyodorov and Fyodorov Williams, um, which we can recover by taking the, this uh, mu d, the signal measure, to just be a single delta mass, right? which is same, having same directions everywhere. Maybe let me start this moment. That's, that's sort of the main result. Okay. Um, let me give you a little bit of a proof sketch. The, the, the main technique in this whole business is called the katz rice formula. So every proof in this business starts with apply the katz rice formula. Um, which is a fairly old formula, you can see here. Uh, it's an exact formula at finite n. So it says that if fn, going from rn to r, is a nice Gaussian process, so this means, whatever, c2, almost surely more. So I mean, I, this is not, we're not talking about things that are not differentiable, as nice as you want, basically. Um, it says the expected number of critical points is given as an integral over rn, which is the base space here, right, of the expected absolute value of the determinant of the Hessian conditioned on criticality, times some function phi sigma, which is easy, so I don't really want to worry about it. Okay. But the point is, the hard thing over here is this, and it converts it into a problem about the Hessian, and the Hessian of a random function is a real symmetric random matrix. Right. And so this really, what this does is this really transforms sort of random geometry on the left-hand side into geometry, into random matrices on the right-hand side. Um, and then it becomes a random matrix problem. Okay. Um, and so the, what's the matrix? It's a Gaussian, it's a real symmetric Gaussian matrix. It's the Hessian of a Gaussian function. Um, in most of the models studied so far, the matrix is closely related to the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, the GOE, um, basically because the, the function has a lot of symmetries and these appear as symmetries satisfied by the Hessian. Um, whereas for non-invariant models like the one I described, what you need is, is uh, to understand when Hn is sort of a Gaussian matrix with fewer symmetries. And if I want to put a one over n log here, I put it here also. And so it becomes this random matrix problem of understanding the expected absolute value of the determinant of some large Gaussian random matrix. Okay. Um, and so we also have results on this side. So how could you guess what this kind of thing should be? Here's uh, an easy way to see it. It's not, I'm not doing anything fancy at the moment. Right, the determinant is just the product of the eigenvalues. Because I have an absolute value, I can move it upstairs in an exponential. And then the sum of logs is the same as the, well, n times the integral against um, the empirical measure, the sort of average of delta masses, of the test function log of absolute value. Okay. And once I've written it like this, it's kind of easy to guess that if I put a one over n log here, and if mu n tends, mu hat n tends to some limit measure mu infinity, like for Wigner matrices it tends to semicircle, then the result should just be the log potential at zero of my limit measure. Okay. And indeed, we can do this. So we have, a, this is, is, is not trivial, it's actually a different paper. Um, but we can do this sort of broadly. So for example, when the matrix Hn is a Wigner or sample covariance matrix with exponential tails, um, I'll go through these, I won't define them in the interest of time, but uh, an erdos renyi graph, or a deregular graph with parameters sort of just bigger than the phase transition, um, a 1D band matrix with any polynomial bandwidth, or a Gaussian matrix, which is what matters for katz rice um, with a mean, a variance profile, or some correlations. I put a little star here because of what the measure is here is a little bit complicated. It's the matrix Dyson equation, which I think Dominic might talk about in the next talk. Um, so let me summarize, uh, and then give you some open questions. So the summary is, is I'm studying random functions, fn, from Rn to R that are signal plus noise functions, um, where the signal is quadratic with kind of different strengths in different directions, stored by some probability measure. So the signal strength is stored with this probability measure. Um, the question I'm asking about these functions is how many critical points do they have? Do they have a lot or not a lot? Um, that's my number sigma, this annealed complexity. And we found that what separates these two phases is the inverse second moment of this signal measure. Um, and the proof goes through the katz rice formula, which is very standard. Uh, but also through new results on determinate concentration for random matrices. So I'll leave you with open questions. Um, 
It's fun to think about. So I keep talking about this inverse second moment. In the proof, it's very natural. For the random matrix folks, it's the second derivative of the Steeltress transform. But I have no heuristics for this on the landscape side. Um, so if people have suggestions, I would love to hear them. Um, you also you want to see this threshold algorithmically, right? I'm, I'm not coding anything. I'm just doing proofs about functions. So uh, the question would be, you know, if you're on the wrong side of this threshold, does gradient descent fail? Um, also, we did this what's called the annealed complexity, which is where you have the log outside of the expectation. Um, but it's probably more natural to want to put it inside. That's called quenched. Um, and what, what happens is, in the case when quenched happens to be equal to annealed, which is true for some spherical spin glasses, we, we kind of know what to do. Um, so here's some results here. Um, but in, in cases where quenched is different from annealed, as far as I know, there is no single model where we have a rigorous understanding of what the quenched asymptotics are. So we have no, we need a Parisi theory. I mean, no one knows what to do in these sorts of cases to actually compute it. Um, and the last sort of wild thing I'll suggest is, is if I take functions not defined on, you know, Rn or a sphere or something, but discrete ones, so random functions on the of some, some hypercube, um, it's not clear what the analogous complexity theory would be. I mean, in, in spin glasses, for people who know, obviously I know, but tap complexity is sort of a special case. But in general, there's, not, there's no critical points, right? So it's not clear how you would even define the question. There's no cat's rice in particular. Um, but since you're asking questions about, you know, do algorithms fail, do algorithms succeed, you can imagine there being some kind of analog that would, you know, be related to this in some sense. Um, but it's not clear how to define anything. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ben. Very nice talk. Just a small technical thing before we yeah. move on to oh, yeah. more interesting questions. Uh, the x squared, or early on slides, you called it lambda squared, with which you rescale the measure. Uh, can you mind? So um, on, on your summary slide, for example. Oh, oh here, yeah, the lambda squared. Was it? Uh, what is the summary slide? Yeah. So this this inverse second moment thing. Yeah, the, the x squared. So what's x? Maybe I, I missed that somehow. Sorry, so this is just... Uh, so, okay, that's what you integrate over. Okay, that was... Yeah, so it's, just, it's an integral of that. Sorry, it was lambda on other slides, so it should have been the same everywhere. But yeah, it's, uh, okay. it's just uh, instead of... I mean, the natural guess for me would have been the first moment, so yeah, x exactly. okay, no, x, but it's yeah, yeah. x. Um, just the inverse second one. Yeah. That would have been natural. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's some more questions uh, from the audience. And I already see one over there. Uh, two questions, actually. Yeah, sorry for that. Please. Uh, the first one is, um, can you do the same calculations so they gets rise by also conditioning on a certain energy level? Yes, yeah, yeah. So you can look in, in, in um, yeah, so there, there is a variant, uh, here, there's a variant of cat's rice that considers uh, critical points where, at which the function takes values in some Borel set. So what, all, that, all that happens is you put, um, you put right here, you put indicator that Fn of sigma is in some Borel set B in R. Um, so we could, we didn't write it up like this for this example that I gave you, but I think we probably could have. Okay. And also I was wondering, since you mentioned that you also have the computation just for the local minima instead yes, of generic yeah. critical point, if uh, the actual value of the uh, complexity coincides uh, among the two, so maybe no. for, for the lowest energy levels, not, not even at, at Oh, sorry, energy. so the, the, um, the, the total complexity is different if you don't look at, if you look at them at energy, and at any, the complexity um, considering all energy levels is different. Uh, we did not do it for low energy levels. Um, it sh but I agree that at low energy levels it should be the same because it should be dominated by local minima at low energy levels. Yes. And sorry, last comment. <laughs> And uh, for the discrete uh, case, mm -hmm. maybe as a um, proxy for the definition of critical points, maybe you can consider stability against one spin flip so that you are, I mean, mm -hmm. for a greedy Monte Carlo, you, you will be in a, in a minimum, essentially. If yeah, yeah, so, so you can, so, so uh, can be done in that sense. I mean, not the same technique, you cannot apply cat's rise, mm -hmm, but that mm -hmm. would be a definition of a local minima. Is, is one where if I go in any, if I spin, flip any spin, then I go up. So, yes, yeah, so I agree. Yeah. This, is a, this is a natural definition of, of local minimum. There's no natural definition that I know of, of a, a saddle point, though. Because um, you could say, I mean, you could say a saddle point is one, you know, I have one saddle point is where I have one direction down, but then everything is a saddle point. But I, I, yes, I agree. This is a natural definition of local minimum. 
Um, and then the question makes more sense, but I have no idea how to count them anymore. Thank you for Thank the question. You. Thank you, Carlo. Are there any more questions from the audience? Or maybe, Marco, are there any questions on the chat? Can you, is there anything that popped up there? And in the meantime, we have a question here. Yeah, I actually have two questions. The yeah. first one is, when you assume this, uh, this D term, the diagonal term is D, mm -hmm. does it make it harder to make it a general positive semi-definite matrix, or you can do a change of basis to make it always diagonal? Uh, um, yeah, because, because V is isotropic, it, it, the distribution is unchanged under orthogonal transformation. So you can, um, I mean, you can diagonalize things. So it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's just a question of the eigenvalues of DM. And also in terms of your log determinant result, this limiting result, mm -hmm. uh, your examples are all Hermitian models. Mm -hmm. uh, have you considered non-Hermitian case? No, we have not. I, they wouldn't appear in Katz Rice because in Katz Rice it comes as a Hessian of some very smooth function, so it's always real symmetric. Um, but this is also a question you could ask for, obviously, for non-Hermitian matrices. Um, I have not thought about this. I don't know what would happen. It's, I mean, from from random matrix perspective, it'd be interesting. I don't know how it would apply on this set. Thank you. Wonderful. We have maybe time for one last quick question. Francesco. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry if uh, uh, I missed it, but uh, what are the conditions on the distribution of uh, the eigenvalues in the end? Do you just require that uh, this uh, 1 over lambda square average is finite or, uh, or ah, something else? So the else? condition is that um, the, the, the limit measure should have compact support in, um, so the support should be in 0 to infinity, so you can't have any directions at 0, and you can have things going to infinity. Um, and then you just need, uh, you need things to be gapped away from 0. So, so I mean, DN, so the limit has to look you know, like this. It, sorry, it doesn't have to have a density, but it has to be in some compact set that doesn't touch zero and doesn't touch infinity. And then the, the, as you're approaching this limit, you can't have eigenvalues touch zero. Um, th there have been a little bit of, uh, it, so th let me just write, write the name down. So there's, there's a, um, where do I have space? Um, so after this, there, there were results of Fyodorov and uh, Bertrand Lacroix chez Tron. Um, that's a paper that, that does, uh, allows a little bit to touch zero um, in a very special way. So, but, but other than this, there are no other assumptions. There's no assumption of density. There's no assumption of anything like this. Um, and, and for all matrices of this type, obviously the inverse second moment exists because it's compact. And it's, you know. Thank you for the question. Wonderful. Let's thank Ben one last time. Thank you very much. Recording stopped.